Okay, so Joan is going to talk, Joan Brugge is going to talk from Harvard on oxidative stress, defenses, and cancer. Take it away, Joan. Okay, so um, what you're looking at here are ways I amused myself on Tuesday after I was shuttled from flight to flight and on the taxiing and back to the, to the, to the um, gate. Uh, at the time, I thought they were pretty humorous. I'm not sure they are now. I was just, I was so frustrated that I actually got a laugh out of them. Um, so uh, I just wanted to first thank the organizers for inviting me to be uh, the keynote speaker tonight, and also special thanks to Bill for um, subbing for me on the, at the very last minute. I could never have done that. I never have a talk ready three or four days in advance. So I was thinking about it, and I, I've played a lot of different roles uh, during the, say, 25 to 30 different Cold Spring Harbor meetings that I've attended over the last 40 years. Um, so I've presented posters. I've given 10, 20, 30-minute talks. I've organized meetings. I've even been the dance instigator. <laughs> um, and <laughs> on one occasion, I actually had to be the toilet paper dispenser. So I think those of you who are the um, organizers of meetings know that there's no job that's too small for a, 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 a meeting organizer. So they were out of toilet paper in the ladies' room, so I had to take care of that. That's what I meant by that. But the most challenging was actually two years ago when I was asked to summarize the Cancer Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology in real time. So basically, Two minutes after the end of the symposium, I had to summarize everything that was discussed. And this covered every single aspect of cancer. And of course, there was this expectation for really great humor and vision and insight. So that, I <laughs> that was definitely the most challenging. And um, it, uh, I've definitely paid more attention to that every talk in that meeting than I've ever had in my life. There was no looking at emails or, or uh, you know, checking the New York Times. Um, but I've actually never given a keynote talk. And I was telling, I was saying this to my son and, and husband over the weekend, because they said, are you going back there again? <laughs> and and um, so Sean, so I was saying to Sean, well, I have never done this before. And, he, and so I told him about all the other different kinds of roles. And he goes, Mom, you have just hit for the cycle. <laughs> so those of you who know baseball, so hitting for the cycle is having a having a single, double, triple, and home run all in one game. But I didn't, it took me four years, actually, to, to hit for the cycle. Okay, so um, can I have the next slide? Let's see, all right. So what I'd like to tell you about today is um, um, a story that basically started a number of years ago, and then more recently we have some new data that I wanted to um, tell you about. <coughs> relating to a totally new player involved in oxidative defenses and cancer. And so what I've done, since this is a keynote talk, is to try to include kind of a general overview on oxidative defenses in cancer as well. So first, I just wanted to start by just discussing the evolving concept about the role of antioxidants in cancer. And those of you who've been in the field <coughs> for a while know that the conventional wisdom about ROS and its role in cancer was that ROS, by inducing um, DNA damage, caused mutations, and these would lead to tumor initiation. And so the thought was that either dietary or some, any kind of treatment that would lead to um, upregulation of antioxidants or treatment with antioxidants would prevent the initiation of tumors. And <clears throat> as a result of this kind of perception, there's a whole industry that's been built around anti dietary antioxidants to prevent the risk or d decrease the risk of cancer or prevent cancer. So it, it is true that there's, there's actually lots of evidence indicating that high levels of ROS can induce mutations and lead to or contribute to the initiation of tumors. However, over, mostly over the last 10 years, there's now lots of evidence that's accumulated that antioxidants may actually make cancer worse. I'm just going to run through a few of the, the initial stories that led to the first, you know, really serious realization of this. And one of them was actually some work that was done in our lab in what was kind of an ancient history now. But it was in early studies where um, this group of really great postdocs and a student were um, kind of working out the 
stages of involved in morphogenesis of a single mammary epithelial cell into a growth arrested polarized hollow um, structure. And what um, especially Jay Debnev found that initially the cells are not polarized and then <coughs> they undergo a, this polarization. Actually, um, Valerie Weaver showed this in, in another cell line even earlier. And at, the same, at that time, it creates a dichotomy between the outer and the inner cells, such that the inner cells are deprived of survival signals. And this leads to the induction of cell death of the cells in the center and the formation of a lumen. And one interesting thing that we had noted was that even if cells, even though there was growth arrest, occasionally you would see kind of a renegade cell that would proliferate. If it proliferated into the center of the structure, it would undergo cell death. And <coughs> At that time, we were interested in using this model in order to understand the early events in tumor genesis, <coughs> stay in just the initiation of, of carcinoma in situ, where basically cells fill the luminal space. And since we had found that when cells aberrantly proliferate that they undergo cell death, this led to the question of what types of events would be necessary in order for these cells to be able to survive in the center of the structure in order to initiate the formation of a carcinoma in situ. And one of the questions that Jay Debnath asked was what would happen or would inhibition of apoptosis be sufficient to allow filling of the luminal space since he had seen that apoptosis was responsible for formation of this lumen. So what Jay did was to introduce BCL2 BCL and, or BCLXL um, to see if that would be sufficient to um, maintain these cells in the center of the structure. And what he found was that he blocked apoptosis Basically, he didn't see any clearing of the luminal space initially, but then he went back and looked at the cultures a week later and found that they were actually completely empty. So it suggested that there was an alternate path to eliminate cells that were kind of in outside their natural environment. And what Jay noticed in just doing translation mission electron microscopy was that even at really early stages before there was any evidence of death or any <coughs> evidence that these cells weren't, weren't um, healthy, that they were filled with autophagic vesicles, the inner cells, suggesting potentially that they the cells were starved and they were eating themselves in order to provide um, the um, nutrients for for um, sort of the survival of the cells. But then it was actually several years before I convinced anyone <coughs> who came to the lab to really <coughs> try to understand what was the basis for this increased autophagy in the cells in the center. And then um, Zach Schaefer came from Sally Kornbluth's lab and was willing to take on that challenge, and Alex Rossian as a student joined him. And what they found um, through a variety of different techniques, one of which was to just look at the metabolism of the cells that were suspended uh, or were grown in suspension without being able to attach to plastic. And we did this because the cells in the center of the structure were no longer making matrix. You can see here laminate 5 is, is, is it's produced in the cells, but it's unable to be deposited. So we think that the, all, all the evidence suggests that that's the basis for this lack of efficient sig signal transduction of um, survival pathways. But anyway, so we initially looked at metabolism in the suspended cells, and what they found was that matrix attachment was required for cells to uptake nutrients. So in the absence of matrix attachment, there was a decrease in glucose, a really significant decrease in glucose and significant decrease in amino acid uptake. And then this led to um, significant metabolic impairments, increased, um, uh, decreased ATP levels, and a significant increase in reactive oxygen. And it was difficult to look at these uh, metabolic um, phenotypes just in the inner cells of the structure, so we used some imaging. Um, um, uh, use imaging to just get some hints about this, and certainly when they looked at um, reactive oxygen species, found that the cells in the center were loaded with reactive oxygen, and then uh, um, two-photon microscopy indicated there were differences in the levels of NAD and NADPH um, at these early times, suggesting at least there was some difference in metabolism. And since there was high, there were, we saw high levels of ROS, the question was, would antioxidants rescue the cells? And sure enough, when um, Zach treated the cells with antioxidants. He found that that prevented the death of the cells. So the ROS was contributing to the elimination of these cells under these conditions. <coughs> so basically, this suggested that ROS may be a checkpoint to eliminate a cell, aberrant cells outside of their natural environment, that is, in, in situations where apoptosis 
was aberrant. And this suggested that you would need both an amp you would need rescue cells from apoptosis as well as a metabolic impairment in order for them to survive outside their natural um, matrix um, environment. And so what we have found is that in a, any of a number of oncogenes, when overexpressed, that are known to be able to su <coughs> suppress apoptosis, were able to block anti-apoptotic activity, but then interestingly, only constitutive activation of the PI3 kinase and AKT pathway would rescue the metabolic impairment. And um, Zach looked at the, the basis for this rescue of the metabolic impairment and found <coughs> that constitutive activation of PI3 kinase or AKT allowed the cells to transport glucose and glutamine when they were not attached to matrix. So they got matrix independent transport of glucose and, glu and glutamine and that rescued the metabolic impairment and the cells were perfectly happy um, in the center of the structure. So we think one reason why PI3 kinase and AKT are so commonly mutated in cancer is because they can not only um, rescue cells from apoptosis, but also rescue cells from metabolic impairments like this and, and potentially other mechanisms that lead to metabolic impairments. Um, I just want any, any of the oncogenes that led to constitutive activation of PI3 kinase would also rescue both of these um, programs. Okay, so this kind of led to a hypothesis at the time when we published this paper, it was actually in 2009, um, that <coughs> displaced cells lose survival signals from ECM, which would lead to apoptosis. But if there was a mutation that, that abrogated the anti-apoptotic checkpoint, the cells would survive initially, but then they, they, would, they would be subjected to this metabolic impairment increase in ROS, and so these abnormal cells would die. So it's kind of a double checkpoint to get rid of these abnormal cells. Now also, and, and in order, so there would be a pressure on cells to upregulate antioxidant programs to prevent ROS um, killing. And then I also showed you that oncogenes like RB2, PI3 kinase prevent apoptosis and rescue metabolic defects. So this would relieve, this would allow these cells to survive. But we also know from uh, um, many reports in the literature that constitutive activation of multiple oncogenes actually, even though they can rescue um, the cells from, from, from the metabolic impairments, they actually can cause increased levels of ROS. And so we think that's why there's also another pressure to upregulate antioxidant genes just due to the aberration or abnormalities or perturbations of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation associated with oncogenes. So all of the, any of these, both of these mechanisms would potentially be ways in which there would be, there would be, or would cause there to be selection for upregulation of antioxidants. And lead to tumor progression. So basically, the pr tumor progression would require, in addition to oncogenes, loss of tumor suppressors, upregulation of antioxidant programs. So in this case, the antioxidants would be would be causing tumor um, would be promoting tumor progression. In this case, antioxidants are preventing tumor initiation. Um, and then in later stages, say once tumors are initiated, antioxidants may allow tumor progression. So I think that. So I'll show you lines of evidence that suggest indeed that this promotion of tumor progression is now f well accepted. And you heard a lot of talks this morning that, that um, provided evidence for this as well. But one of the, one of the studies in humans was actually a tri epidemiologic trial where they treated, um, they treated men with, um, or they dietary, used dietary supplements of vitamin E, and they found instead of preventing cancer, which was predicted, that they actually got an increase in um, uh, incidence of prostate cancer. And then there have been several other trials in other types of cancer, which also um, provided evidence that dietary oxidants would increase the incidence of cancer. I mean, these are kind of, can be difficult to interpret, but um, a lot of studies in mice now have supported this idea. And this is a study from Virgo's lab where they used a um, transgenic gem model with a BRAF mutant and showed that the um, dietary supplements of either vitamin E or and SNTL cysteine dramatically promoted tumor progression. And then um, Dave Tubison's lab found that KRAS activates a really strong antioxidant program that you heard about this morning, NRF2. So they, had, and actually Gina did this, Gina who you heard from this morning, um, looked at the effects of loss of NRF2 in the context of the KRAS mutant pancreatic tumors, and in fact, loss of this oxidative stress um, program 
significantly reduce the incidence of panamnesian. So again, that supported the idea that antioxidants are necessary for initial outgrowth of tumors. And then Zach Isaac Harris um, in Pac Max Lab looked at um, in the effects of inhibition of the major um, antioxidant glutathione by <coughs> looking at the effects of either inhibition or knockout of GCLC, the, the um, rate limiting enzyme involved in glutathione production in the metal T background. And they found that this prevented um, tumor progression. So they saw initiation, but there was no metastasis and invasion. So this suggested in addition that you need it for the initial stages of tumor formation. Okay, and then obviously the best evidence was the genetic evidence in humans that um, components, any of the three components, or two components of the um, um, uh, complex that regulates the stability of NRF2 or mutations in F2 that lead to uh, prevent it from interacting with this degradation complex would um, also, or are, are associated with cancer. And, and you heard a lot about this this morning, so this is really strong evidence. And then, Mutations in an NRF2 pathway are not the only way to upregulate antioxidants. I just show this um, heat map from that Laura Selfers and Isaac Harris generated from triple negative from breast cancers, and this is just a list of 150 either positive or negative redox regulatory genes. And you can see that um, triple negative and HER2 positive have high levels of the um, um, of antioxidant genes that would promote antioxidant um, or antioxidant enzymes. None of these are, and there, no, none of this involved, uh, these were not, didn't involve mutations in the NRF2 pathway. So there's many different mechanisms that can lead to upregulation of antioxidants. So basically, it's just, ta just taking a, a figure from a review of, of TAC and Isaacs. And there's, besides loss of um, ECM leading to ROS, there's many other types of stresses associated with tumor progression that lead to high levels of ROS. So tumors need to upregulate antioxidant programs to prevent unopposed loss and cell death. And then also, this is all kind of all tumor formation, but then um, Sean Morrison's lab um, has shown that um, loss of, most likely loss of ECM associated with um, circulation, circulating tumor cells in early stages of metastasis is also uh, a, a condition in which you need antioxidant protection in order for the cells to survive and initiate um, metastasis as well. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you about now is a story that actually was just recently published, and it's, it in <coughs> involves the identification of a totally new player that's involved in, in, in tolerance to oxidative stress. And this work was done by an instructor in my lab, um, Nobu Takahashi. And Nobu is a neurobiologist that has been working on TRIP-A1 for about 10 years, and he had noticed that TRIP-A1 was upregulated in a variety of different cancers, and <coughs> because of that work that we had done in the 3D system, relating to breast cancer, he came to our lab to explore whether trip A1, the TRIP-A1 channel may be regulating um, oxidative stress. And I'll show you shortly why he was suspicious about that. So just as a little background, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of the TRIP channels. They're channels that are predominantly expressed in peripheral sensory nerves, and they regulate a whole variety of different, or they respond to a whole, they sense a whole variety of different types of insults. So TRIP-A1 is one of these. And what's really unique about TRIP-A1 and led uh, uh, Nobu to be interested in coming to our lab to look at it is that TRIP-A1 has four cysteines in its cytoplasmic tail. And these cysteines are highly reactive with reactive oxygen species as well as strong electrophiles. And so this, the reaction, uh, interaction with these cysteines or oxidation of the cysteines leads to an opening of the channel. So these are calcium permeable channels. Um, you may think you don't know much about it, but in, if you've had wasabi, that in instant kind of repulsive feeling uh, or sense that you get is actually due to the major component of wasabi called AIPC that is a strong electrophile, reacts with those cysteines and opens the channel. But this channel is also involved in a, a number of inflammatory responses. It's supposed to, it's believed to be the um, channel that's responsible for chronic uh, atop, atyp atypical um, asthma. Um, and also responsible for pain that's associated with some chemotherapies and aromatase inhibitors. So it's a really interesting channel. And the reason why he was interested is this is data from the TCGA. So this is just a number of the different TRIP channels. And you can see there's multiple tumor types that have very high levels 
of trip A1. This is uh, breast, kidney, the lung squamous, and lung adenocarcinoma. If you look at the um, genetic alterations, there's um, some tumors that have high level amplification. The highest is the neural sheath tumors, MPNSTs, where 24 and 25% have high levels of amplification. When, um, and then if you look at um, breast tumors, so this is just the different subtypes of breast tumors, and here's trip A1 here. You can see that there, it's, not, it's expressed in all subtypes of breast cancer. Um, and then um, NOBU verified by um, using a highly validated antibody, which he validated using knockout um, uh, tumor cells in which trip A1 was knocked out, that the protein is high, expressed at high levels in a reasonable proportion of breast tumors. And what he's found, and just summarize what he's learned, is that protein expression um, is detected in, in both human tumors and PDX models, but more limited expression in cell lines. And we think that's because in, in many cases, trip A1 is amplified, and that's why you see high levels. But it's also induced by a whole variety of, of environmental factors. So for instance, reactive oxygen species will activate it. And it turns out that it's a direct target of NRF2. And Nobu shows all the evidence for that in his paper. But also TNF alpha and H1, H, HIF1 alpha also activate it. So within tumors, uh, within the tumor environment, there are many um, factors, environmental factors, that can lead to strong upregulation uh, in, in addition to amplification. This is just one example where these are two um, breast tumor cell lines that have very low levels of trip A1. But if you treat them with H2O2, if you um, induce oxidative stress, you get really high, high levels as well. OK, so one of the first questions that Nobu was interested in asking is, is overexpression of this trip A1 channel, is it functional in tumor cells? It's there, but can it function as a, as a calcium channel in the tumor cells? And so the first thing he did was to take a tumor cell line that had high levels of trip A1. Um, these are a, a basal A triple negative cell line. And he stimulated them with the AITC from Wasabi and, um, and then looked at, did single cell um, recording um, using FURO2 to measure calcium influx. And what he found was a really nice induction of, of uh, calcium influx, and it was totally, it totally correlated with the levels of trip A1. This is in, in, four, in four different tumor cell lines, I mean breast tumor cell lines. But then he also looked in a whole set of lung tumor cell lines or in some MPNSTs that we got from Karen Chikowsky. And in every case, the level of induction paralleled the extent of expression of the, of the trip A1. So it's clearly functional in these tumor cells. Um, does it protect from oxidative stress? So is, does this opening the calcium channel affect the ability of the cell to survive under conditions of, of oxidative stress? So what Nobu did was to treat the cells with increasing concentrations of H2O2 and then record the cell number. And you can see in all, these are just all the lung lines, that the extent of protection, you know, they're shifting the sensitivity curve, uh, caused by inhibition of the trip A1 channel. One thing nice about these, working with these channels, they have really good stimulators and inhibitors, uh, was totally correlated with the level of expression of trip A1. So the more trip A1, the, um, the more significant sensitization you got with inhibition of trip A1. Okay, and then a kind of a slightly more functional assay was to address whether downregulation or inhibition of trip A1 would affect the ability of the cells to grow in soft agar. So we had found, and, and others as well, that there's an increase in ROS in cells that are in suspension or cells that are put in, in um, soft agar. So the question was, is trip A1 important for maintaining the viability of cells in soft agar? So he used two different hairpins and knocked down trip A1 or used the trip A1 inhibitor, which I showed you in the other slide, and you can see that under both conditions, either genetic or, or um, pharma pharmacological knockdown, there's a significant reduction in the survival of these cells that have high levels of trip A1. This is just a quantification of that. Okay, so we wanted to look at this in a more, con um, uh, in a context where we could look more at the spatial context of the, of trip A1 and the, um, what, how it was functionally regulating tumor cell growth. So Nobu cultured the cells in 3D, as 3D spheroids. So one question is, is trip A1 activated in the spheroids and, spheroids, and if so, where? And does it correlate with the levels of ROS? So what he did was to, um, uh, 
in addition, then in order, and then in addition, look at whether it's required for survival of the cell. So knock it down or treat with an agonist and look at the survival of the cell. So um, this shows the imaging that Nobu did, either using Hyper2, which is a genetically encoded sensor, and use ratiometric imaging. So look at the levels of H2O2. And then he also did Pura2, used for Pura2 to look at the levels of calcium. So you can see here that there's an in a gradient of ROS and a gradient of calcium. And if he knocked down or inhibited trip A1, um, there was an inhibition of the calcium influx it, within the center cells. However, there was no change in the ROS. So ROS was still high when you knocked down trip A1, um, but there was a, it, it clearly was an eliminating the calcium signal. So this indicated that the calcium signal in these cells that have high trip A1 was due to trip A1. OK, and then um, oh, this is just a quantification of that. OK, so he kept those cells in culture longer and then looked at whether it would affect the survival of the cell. And so what he did then was to um, look for um, cleave caspase 3 by staining. And you can see when you knock down trip A1 in these spheroids that you get an increase in, in caspase staining. So one really important point is even though those control cells had high levels of ROS, they were perfectly happy. So the cells were able to survive in the context of that. But if you knock down trip A1, they underwent apoptosis. And this is at day 10 um, after putting the cells in culture. And then at day 15, Basically, essentially all the cells in the center of the structure were gone. This is when I started to really believe in this project because it was so dramatic that specifically the cells that had high levels of ROS and um, calcium were, were eliminated when you um, knocked down trip A1. He also saw the same thing with the antagonism. And also he saw the same result in lung tumor spheroids and a breast PDX model, and that's all in the paper. Okay, so these results indicate that there's um, in uh, cells that express high level of trip A1, there's a correlation between calcium influx and high levels of ROS, um, and that when you eliminate trip A1, these cells undergo cell death. So it suggested that trip A1 is maintaining the viability of those cells in the context of this high ROS. So this, is, um, so this suggested that trip A1 was necessary for the survival of those cells, but would it be sufficient if to protect cells from ROS-associated cell death. So in order to do that, we took MCF10A cells, which I showed you before, undergo this um, induction of apoptosis in, during the normal morphogenesis, and we asked whether if you overexpress trip A1, would you prevent the induction of cell death of these during this normal morphogenesis? So one question was, um, does, is the tr does the trip A1 channel work in MCF10A cells? And so <clears throat> would it be responsive to, re to um, reactive oxygen? So he treated with H2O2 and then followed calcium. And these are the vector control 10As. There was no increase in calcium. Um, but the trip A1 cells, there was really nice induction of calcium. So trip A1 works when overexpressed in MCF 10A, 10A cells. So then this is the imaging of those 10A cells that either this is a control or trip A1 overexpressors. So one thing interesting is that when trip A1 was overexpressed, it did not affect the levels of ROS. So you did not get a, a, um, a neutralization of ROS like you do with many antioxidant um, uh, factors. However, you can see here that we do see functional trip A1 in the 3D structures because you see calcium. So trip A1 is in there, you get high ROS, you get trip A1, um, but trip A1 overexpression doesn't prevent the ROS. And then this just shows that in these cells, when you inhibit the trip A1 channel, that you prevent that. So this, again, it's due to trip A1. The calcium is due to trip A1. So what happens over time? So this is uh, looking at cell death. You can see here, and, and Nobu has quantified this, and all the quantification is in the paper. So there's a really dramatic inhibition of, of apoptosis in cells overexpressing trip A1, and the cells are able to survive and proliferate in the center of the structures. So basically, these results show that trip A1 allows cancer cells to tolerate elevated ROS. It doesn't neutralize the ROS, but the cells are, fail to undergo apoptosis under conditions in which there is high ROS. OK, so one other thing I wanted to tell you about was um, what he found with um, um, regulation of carboplatin sensitivity in trip A1. 
So I mentioned that, that strong electrophiles will activate TRPA1, and carboplatin had actually been shown previously to induce opening of TRPA1. So the thought then was that if treatment with carboplatin opens the TRPA1 channel, and what I showed you is that it strongly protects cells and, in, and is, induces a strong anti-apoptotic program, would this actually reduce the potency of, of the chemotherapy by neutralizing ROS or by preventing apoptosis? So the question is then, is if we treat it with a TRPA1 antagonist, um, would we increase the sensitivity to carboplatin? So that's what uh, Nobu did. So one question is, just in, our, in, in, in these cells that we've been looking at, does carboplatin cause calcium influx? Yes, it does. Um, and if you inhibit TRPA1 or knock it down, you don't see the calcium influx. It's quantification. Um, and then if you treat with carboplatin and knock down TRPA1, you get a shift in the sensitization to car carboplatin. So the cells become much more sensitive or they become more sensitive to carboplatin under these conditions. The effect is actually stronger in some of these tumor cells that express even higher levels. So these are those lung tumor cell lines, and these are the MPNSTs. And you can see here that the cells with the highest level, you see the strongest shift in the sensitivity to carboplatin under conditions in which you inhibit TRPA1. So this suggests that um, antagonizing TRPA1 could increase the sensitization to carboplatin, but also potentially to, to radiation because uh, radiation-induced death is, uh, ROS can, is, is, is one of the major contributors to um, um, induction of death by radiation. So then he's done several different um, experiments in vivo. This is um, actually summation of two different experiments. So the question was, he took the 1569 tumor cells. They're actually, we didn't know it, but we, we found, so this is treatment with carboplatin and the, and the hairpin and the, hair, and the SH control. So they basically are insensitive to carboplatin. Now, if you just knock down TRPA1 with either of the two different hairpins, you see that there's a, a significant reduction in the growth of the tumor. But then when you add carboplatin, you see that there's a significant um, increase in the um, response to carboplatin under conditions in which you have reduced TRPA1. And this just shows the, um, the H&E. There's actually a tremendous amount of necrosis in the cells with TRPA1, and there's also an increase in cleave caspase 3. So it suggests that in vivo as well as in vitro, you can, get, you can sensitize cells to carboplatin. So what I'm going to just summarize here is um, what we learned about the mechanism whereby um, TRPA1 is able to um, induce this strong anti-apoptotic response. So Nobu, <laughs> I took out all the slides because I thought there wouldn't be time, but Nobu did about 100 different blots with you know, hundreds of different proteins. Um, and then we also used RPPA in collaboration with Gordon Mills to look at what programs were enriched under conditions in which TRPA1 was expressed and what programs were downregulated under conditions in which we inhibited TRPA1 in the tumor cell. And to make a very long story short, and this is just the way it was done, we tried multiple different conditions as well. This is amazing. Okay, so make a long story short, what he found is that ca calcium influx causes a strong activation of RAS, induction of GTP loading on RAS, which leads to strong activation of the ERK and PI3 kinase mTOR pathways. It's really, really significant. And um, which leads to an induction of strong anti-apoptotic programs. And one of the strongest proteins was induced was MCL1, the anti-apoptotic protein that we heard about today. So one of the questions that Nobu asked was, okay, if, if high MCL1 is one of the consequences of upregulation of this pathway, what if you just inhibited MCL1, would you mimic the effects of downregulation of TRPA1? And they actually found that, and this is just one of several different um, um, it, one of several figures in, in the paper, but as you can see here, when you quantified the number of cells that had either clear, completely clear, or mostly clear uh, lumen, there was just a really dramatic, like 66% were either clear or mostly clear in the cells treated with MCL1. So MCL1 is a really significant contributor to this program. Okay, so then the next question was, how does calcium influx activate RAS, and actually there are papers that in the literature that had already worked out a mechanism whereby calcium activated RAS. So we looked at that first, 
and we found that that, what, that at least one of those mechanisms that's out there is, is operative in these cells. So interestingly, cow modulin binds to the one of the anchor and repeats in the TRIP-A1 cytoplasmic tail, so it's basically sitting there ready to go. And then when cow calcium binds cow modulin, it leads to a, um, upper, uh, act activation of PIC2, um, which then leads to activation of, of RAS-GTP. So this program is um, activated significantly in the cells and leads to the activation of RAS and this downstream program. Okay, so just to summarize then, um, what we know from, from, the lit from many years of investigation of oxidative stress programs that the canonical pathways responsible for, uh, for allowing cells to adapt to oxidative stress are, are a whole set of different um, antioxidant enzymes that lead to ROS neutralization. So you actually get downregulation of, of ROS. And NRF2 and NF-kappa B are two transcription factors that are the two major transcription factors that regulate these large, these significant programs with multiple genes induced that regulate, um, uh, that cause ROS neutralization. But what I've shown you here that is another non-canonical pathway for ROS, <coughs> for ad adapting to high levels of ROS is activation of this TRIP channel um, which leads to a very strong anti-apoptotic um, uh, response, anti-apoptotic program that allows cells to be able to tolerate loss. And interestingly, what Nobu found in the last stages of this, uh, recent stages of this project, is I mentioned it earlier, there's actually ARE elements, which are the elements that NRF2 transcription factor binds to within the TRIP-A1 channel. So this NRF2, cha NRF2 transcription factor is not only activating these canonical and ROS neutralized pro programs, but it's also upregulating the TRIP-A1 channel. And we think this is a very significant player because in those, in one of the, or in two of the different um, uh, long tumor cell lines we've used, there is mutation in KEEP1, but or neutraliz or inhibition of TRIP-A1 was sufficient to cause death of the cells in the center. So we think this is one of the major programs um, responsible for ROS adaptation or ROS tolerance in under conditions of oxidative stress. Okay, so then just thinking about what are the therapeutic implications of this and other things that you've heard about today. Um, so obviously raises the question whether counteracting antioxidants could enhance therapies that are associated with ROS. So therapies in which ROS is contributing to the cytotoxicity of the cell, could we sensitize the cells to these um, by, um, count by inhibiting antioxidants? And this would in include radiation chemotherapy, and then a number of targeted therapies have been shown to, um, and Ross has shown to be an important component of a number of different targeted therapies. Um, okay, so we're antioxidant targets. There's obviously a lot of different antioxidant targets. I mentioned TRIP-A1, and we're, we're um, now look, starting to look with, in collaboration with uh, investigators at Dana-Farber, whether radiation, we can in increase the sensitivity to radiation with TRIP-A1 um, uh, inhibition. Obviously, NRF2, and this has been discussed, it's not easy to inhibit, and I've added, modified the slides since the talks this morning, so this could involve Dagron to, um, uh, to degrade NRF2, or, um, as we heard this morning, the, the <coughs> um, potentially inhibition of this um, kinase that regulates plication of, of NRF2. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other uh, antioxidant enzymes that we don't know a whole lot about, but um, there's some recent papers that strongly suggest that GPX4, which regulates um, lipid peroxidation, is really important in a, in a number of tumor cells, especially tumor cells that have undergone a mesenchyme transition, either tumor cells that are, have a mesenchyme nature to begin with or cells that undergo a mesenchyme transition um, after treatment with therapy, so persister cells. And there's a really nice paper collaboration with a group at ECSF and Stuart Schreiber's group. And then a, a, a number of, another approach is to prevent glutathione production. So glutathione is present in millimolar levels. It's a major antioxidant. And um, for, so for instance, inhibiting GCLC that, that is a rate limiting enzyme for um, glutathione production is another um, mechanism. However, uh, Isaac Harris in our lab has found that most tumor cells are very resistant to only blocking glutathione. So you need additional, you need to inhibit additional pathways as well. Okay. so. Then one needs to consider um, other aspects of antioxidants and thinking about therapeutic, the therapeutic implications of inhibiting antioxidants. So antioxidants 
um, may promote cancer, so you want to inhibit those to prevent cancer or inhibit or to cause regression. But antioxidants also prevent aging or associated diseases. So it's not totally straightforward how to, how to, what, are the right, what are the appropriate targets and what's the best way to approach the therapeutic uh, intervention. So it's critical to understand the mechanisms that are involved in antioxidant promotion of cancer, as well as um, the, those that are, <coughs> those whose inhibition would um, affect the aging phenotypes as well. And so we need to identify specific mechanisms and antioxidant programs that are involved in phenotypes associated with both cancer and aging and determine the feasibility of differential targeting to prevent both types of diseases. So we want to prevent cancer and we want to prevent aging. So is it, we, need to look, we need to understand these, um, the factors involved in these in order to be able to do, uh, in order to be able to prevent both of them. Okay, so then lastly, the only last point I want to make is that Pretty impressive the extent to which calcium influx was able to activate this anti-apoptotic program. And it's been known that calcium can do this. We were just particularly impressed by how, a, how opening a channel under the conditions of oxidative stress can lead to it. There's lots of other calcium channels, both <coughs> plasma membrane channels as well as intracellular channels. Um, and there's evidence in the literature here and there, just kind of spotty, that other, other calcium uh, channels could be are altered in cancer, and I think that you know, we, it deserves a much more intensive look um, because it's likely that these calcium programs, <coughs> which are known to regulate some aspects of, of proliferation, that they also might be really important for um, preventing apoptosis under a whole variety of different conditions. And again, the challenges here is to understand you know, how, cal uh, how, to, how to do this because calcium controls so many different functions and it's regulated in so many different ways that you know, it's not totally straightforward to understand exactly how to, how you would approach it therapeutically. I think the AAA1 is a good example of how you can get a specific antagonism. Okay, and then I wanted to um, acknowledge again the people that in, were involved with this. So I just wanted to say that Nobu is responsible for basically almost, uh, basically every experiment that I showed um, relating to AAA1. However, we had multiple collaborators that provided all kinds of models um, that, um, models or even genetic um, manipulation of vectors that contribute to this. And then Gordon Mills played a really important role in our identification of the mechanisms that were involved through the RPPA analysis. Um, and, um, and then I think I acknowledged all the people that were involved in earlier work. So Nobu is really a superstar in my mind. He's you know, incredibly smart. He works really hard and he's a really great person to interact with. How many questions? Just this one. <laughs> so it was a great talk. The, it, if, if that's the pathway, then FAC inhibitors, which inhibit PIK2 most of the time, should also work. Have you tried that? We didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we just did knock down to, to verify the role of PIK2. But I'm pretty I sure. I didn't think about that. We should those are, those are in the clinic, yeah, so. Yeah, right. So most of them do um, inhibit PIK2. I'm pretty too. sure they do, yeah. I, we should do that. I brought a pen and paper here because I always forget what questions are asked. I have a bit of a naive question, but was there a thought to actually modulate the chemotherapy drug not to bind TRPA1? I, I don't think that would work. I think that it's part of the mechanism of action, that strong electrophilic okay. activity. So, so is there I, no I, specific element there that... I don't know. Are there any chemists in here? I think that would be difficult. Just a quick question. Do you have an idea based on your FURA measurements, what level of calcium does trigger it? Because it all depends on the levels of the calcium that will promote the survival. Yes, so um, I, I, it's in the paper. I, I just okay. can't remember now. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and it's interesting. You see these oscillations, yeah. which you don't necessarily see in the sensory neurons, neurons when they're activated. So it turns out that when calmodulin binds calcium, I mean bound, binds to, yeah, when it binds calcium, it inhibits the channel. So you get this oscillation because you're, 
your, 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 you know, the, the effector of the of ca the calcium effector is actually shutting it off, and so that's why you get this oscillation. But I, I, I can look it up for you. I just can't remember what it was. Uh, thank you. So, um, any evidence in vivo? Uh, maybe there is already a knockout for this gene. So, any evidence in vivo that this affects tumorigenesis in mouse models? So, no one has crossed it into um, any of the established gem models, but we'd like to do that. We just haven't done it yet. Um, mostly, they've been focused on the sensory neuron aspect of it, so they can, you know, they can reduce the, the as we can reduce asthma and asthma models, and they can reduce pain and pain models, but nobody, we haven't, we haven't done it. But I think it would be good to do that. Hello. Um, I'm just curious, have you done any mechanism to understand the, the recognition of chop uh, one a in your system? The regulation? Yes. So, um, okay, so in each of the different models, there's, there's different basis for ex ex high level expression. So in several models, it's amplified. So for instance, in the MPMNSTs, there's amplification of trpa one in one of the breast lines. Um, and then um, TNF-alpha activates at like 500-fold. HIF, HIF can induce it. Um, ROS, just, just ROS in the tumor microenvironment induces it. And NRF2 is probably, in the lung, it's probably the strongest uh, uh, regulator of NRF2. I mean, sorry, of, of trip A1. Joan, um, do you have any insight into whether there are pulses of ROS that lead to pulses of calcium influx, or whether there's constitutive ROS that causes constitutive opening of the channel? So I don't think that Nobu has followed single cells in when he did the furo 2 staining in the spheroid. It's a general blind spot in the field because we have such dull tools yeah. to monitor, especially the temporal component of ROS. Oh, of ROS but it probably yeah. has a big impact on the biology. It yeah, probably so is completely different. I think different. the hyper 2 doesn't give you that temporal, um, but that, that would be really nice. Yeah, so if you had a very short-lived um, sensor. Yeah, yeah that's really good. Hmm? Use, the sensors all use cysteine oxidation. Yeah. Usually. So right. the problem is that you're measuring the anti. You're, you're, it's not really yeah. measuring You'd just the pulse. You have to have it die. You have to have it die right now. You, yeah, but even the die. That's a, so DCF is also the same thing. It yeah. precipitates. Yeah. You can't do it. <laughs> Can I? Uh, I've had the mic for a while, and I think there's like some. Back there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should have sat in the front so <laughs> I can stump it easier. But um, just very briefly, maybe I missed it, but um. Since um, TRIP1 seems to be amplified in some cancer types um, in a subset of patients, is there an effect on survival or, or, or do they react better or worse to chemotherapy? I mean, the actual patients in TCGA where you saw... Um, oh, does it correlate if you do a Kaplan-Meier analysis? For example, yeah. Yeah, I'm always afraid to do that because Bill Kalin like, <laughs> will be after me. Um, so there is a survival benefit. It's not... It's, it's significant, but it's weakly significant. But we didn't have a, a, a cohort of patients that were treated specifically with one chemotherapy, you know, because if, if, you know, if you're doing a lot of different chemotherapies, some of which activate trip A1 and some don't, it, it makes it difficult to interpret. In that case, is it, I mean, does it get amplified in some cancer types in, in the metastasis? During metastasis, actually we or, have. Or, or, in, or in recurrence. We haven't looked at those databases. Yeah, we should we should look at that. Actually, we don't see it on the regulation. You don't see it? Yeah, you looked. And what about what about <laughs> what about Lou's lab, Lou Chodas's lab? Did the metastasis? Did you see trip A one, or could you look for that for Lou? Did you make any? direct observations regarding cell polarity and the flow of electrostatics through the cell and how that affects the pathway? Since this does, since this is a charge change across the membrane, has that affected the flow of the molecules and the recruitment to this pathway? So the tumor cells we looked at are all unpolarized and the 
10 A. Yeah. The inner cells in the 10 A's, they're not polarized either. So the cells that are responsive, where there's high ROS, I think that wouldn't be, that we wouldn't be able to look at that. It wouldn't be a factor. Yeah, I have a question regarding, so trip A1, you said um, it can resist ROS. Has anyone looked at DNA repair aspects of responses? Instead of looking at, at, at antioxidants, does trip A1 regulate any DNA repair mechanism that, you know, that's overexpressed in these cells and, or something like that? So it would have to be a, a distinct calcium regulated DNA repair because, you know, what we, what we were looking at was anti-apoptotic. So I think you would still get DNA damage uh, based on that. So if there are calcium regulated DNA damage pathways, are there? I yeah, don't know of any, but that's an interesting question. What else? Yeah, I don't know. So is there any other questions? If not, uh, I would like to start off by thanking Joan for a wonderful talk and a, and a great discussion.